I'm Dr. Linda Young, and welcome to Health Matters, a television program produced by the Worcester District Medical Society in conjunction with WCCA-TV here in Worcester. I'm very excited today to have um, some excellent physicians to join us. We have some interesting topics to talk about cancer of the bladder and the kidney, something that uh, we don't hear that much about, and I think it's something that's very pertinent for us to, uh, to discuss today. So with me today are two physicians. First, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jennifer Yates. Dr. Yates is a urologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. She did her training at Brown in Providence and did her fellowship in urology at Hackensack Medical Center in New Jersey. She serves as the residency program director and vice chair of academic affairs. Her clinical interests and the majority of her practice focuses on kidney and bladder cancers. Our next other guest is Dr. Kriti Middle. She's a section leader of genital urinary oncology in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Massachusetts. She completed her residency training at our own St. Vincent Hospital here in Worcester and went on to complete her hematology oncology training at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Dr. Middle's research interests include developing clinical trials in bladder cancer and conducting clinical research in prostate and kidney cancers. So thank you both. Thank you for joining me, and it's a pleasure to have you here. So I have a lot of questions for you, and I'm going to start with you, Jen. Um, what is bladder cancer? That's a great question. So thank you for having us here today to talk about a topic that uh, we address very frequently in our patient population. And I think it's important first to start with a definition of bladder, a little anatomic uh, introduction. Some people confuse gallbladder versus urinary bladder. And what we're focusing on today is the urinary bladder, um, which stores urine and then obviously people void. Um, when we're talking about bladder cancer, there's a variety of tumors that can arise in the bladder. And typically, Krithi and I treat cancers that are called urothelial cancers. That's the vast majority here in the United States. If you were to travel overseas, there's different types of cancers that are treated there. Um, and bladder cancer arises in the lining of the bladder. Uh, the reason we mention kidney cancer briefly today is because it also can affect the kidneys and the ureters, the tubes that connect the uh, kidney and the bladder. Um, so we kind of think of that all together when we're talking about bladder cancer. And a tumor arises in the bladder. We'll talk a little bit later about um, the signs and the symptoms and how we detect that, how as we as uh, physicians, primary care doctors, urologists, medical oncologists can detect it. And um, then uh, once we have signs and symptoms, we will talk a little bit more about how we can treat bladder cancer and some of the more advanced uh, modalities that we have uh, today. So just to summarize, this is the urinary bladder. Um, many tumors that arise there are cancers. Many of them are not very aggressive, though, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And there's a lot of good news on the bladder cancer front. Oh, that's mm -hmm. encouraging to hear. Yes. Thank you. So, Krivi, tell me about the epidemiology and tell me what is epidemiology first before we go into that. Great question. Um, thanks again for having us. Mm -hmm. These are very exciting times for patients and physicians treating genital urinary tumors, particularly bladder cancer. So epidemiology basically means data or numbers of patients who are affected by a cancer type, um, gender differences, um, racial differences, and things like that. And sometimes we also then move forward into risk factors when we talk about epidemiology. Mm -hmm. So the American Cancer Society has estimated that there will be approximately 84,000 new cases mm -hmm. of bladder cancer in the United States this year. Unfortunately, this disease disproportionately affects men more than women. Um, bladder cancer is the fourth most common type of cancer in men. The average age at diagnosis is about 73, so this does tend to affect the older population, although we are seeing instances of younger individuals being diagnosed with bladder cancer. So early recognition, reporting signs that Jen will talk about later to primary care physicians early on is very important. And the biggest risk factor I always emphasize, and primary care physicians do as well, is smoking. Smoking increases the risk of bladder cancer by three to four times. It's the biggest risk factor for developing bladder cancer. And I'm just going to pick up on that for a second because I know that even if you maybe smoked when you were in college or early on in your 20s, that makes you a risk 
for bladder cancer later on in life. Is that correct? I think it is true, although the data we have from several decades ago, it's changing, so I mm. can't speak to what the most recent numbers are. But uh, the general number we use is something called odds ratio. Mm -hmm. So how does your risk as an active smoker vary compared to that of a general average patient who doesn't smoke? And smoking at this time would increase your risk by about three to four times. So that's one good thing you can do if you're smoking, stop. That would that's be helpful. Right. So Jen, is bladder cancer, does it run in families? Is it hereditary? That's a good question. So a lot of times when we diagnose a patient with bladder cancer, that's their first question is, did I get this from a family member? Could I pass it on to my children? It's a really scary thought. And we always want to have answers as to why things happen. Um, Krithi just spoke about a lot of the reasons people uh, have bladder cancer, the big one being um, smoking. Um, but there are some genetic syndromes, and there's one in particular that we think about that we're learning a little bit more about these days as it relates to other cancers. It's called Lynch syndrome. It's a rare cancer, but it does increase the risk of um, bladder cancer and cancer of the kidneys and ureters. And other um, cancers that go along in that family, uh, namely, would be uh, colon cancer. That's the big one. And then there's some other mm -hmm. gynecologic cancers as well that are associated with Lynch syndrome. So a patient diagnosed with bladder cancer should not automatically think that they have Lynch syndrome or genetic syndrome. Um, there does seem to be a predilection for bladder cancer. So every patient who smokes doesn't get bladder cancer. And thank goodness. we thank goodness indeed. Same with same with lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, not every patient who smokes develops lung cancer. So we know that there's some genetic predisposition, and it is very possible and quite likely that there are genetic factors in families that predispose to the cancer. It doesn't mean a patient will definitely get that cancer mm -hmm. in their lifetime, um, but we do know that there are factors that contribute to it in addition to the other um, risk factors that we spoke about. Great. Um, also a question to you, what, are, what would be the common signs or symptoms that something might be wrong? Absolutely. So symptoms from a patient standpoint, the biggest one that we worry about is blood in the urine. It is never normal to have blood in the urine. And, and honestly, there are so many different non-cancerous causes of blood in the urine. Um, a lot of times urinary tract infections, as our patients get older, urinary tract infections happen more frequently. So often that will be associated with microscopic or visible blood in the urine. Um, but any time a patient sees any blood in the urine with their naked eye, that needs to be reported to the primary care physician. And so many times, Krithi and I hear a patient say, it just happened once. I didn't think anything else of it. And months go by, years go by sometimes, and by the time we diagnose the cancer, it's much more advanced. So reporting it that first time is so critical so that we can diagnose the cancer early. Microscopic blood in the urine is not detected by the patient. That is something that the primary care doctor may see on a, a urine test. Microscopic blood in the urine is less likely to be associated with cancer, but still needs to be evaluated. So primary care physicians often refer their patients to us, urologists, um, for evaluation of the kidneys and the ureter and the bladder to make sure there's no stones or cancers. Um, so those are the big ones that we think about. Very rarely, the only presenting symptom a patient may have is frequency of urination, burning. Um, there's kind of a myriad of symptoms that overlap with urinary infections. Um, so I, I think the important take-home message is if there's something that's new for a patient and they're concerned, they should report it to their primary care doctor. The take-home message also should be not every symptom is going to be cancer. So be alert, uh, report blood in the urine but also rest assured that not every time we see one of these symptoms or signs does it equate with cancer. Okay. Some of the terms that I have heard have been uh, the uh, superficial or invasive. Can you differentiate that for me? Sure. So as Jen alluded to earlier, bladder cancer typically starts in the innermost lining of the bladder, and this lining is called the urothelium. It is right next to the lumen of the bladder where the urine is stored. So in my clinic, I often explain to patients that a bladder in cross-section really looks like an avocado. You <laughs> take the pit out when you cut the avocado, and that's the lumen, just like the bladder has urinary storage capacity there. So the innermost lining is where the cancer starts. Mm -hmm. Patients who have superficial bladder cancers have cancers that are either protruding into the lumen of the mm -hmm. Uh, bladder, or perhaps going into the basement membrane that lies right beneath the surface of the innermost lining. So 70% of patients at the time of diagnosis have superficial or non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These patients are considered to be um, 
potentially curable, these patients with early detection and appropriate management can have long-term survivals with making sure they're compliant with their follow-ups. The mainstay of treating superficial cancers is actually um, a procedure called TURBT, or transurethral resection of bladder tumors, which is routinely performed by Jen's team. Um, depending on what our pathologists find under the mm. microscope from these tumors, some of these patients may benefit from receiving treatments given directly within the bladder mm -hmm. through a catheter. Um, patients may have heard of drugs such as BCG that are often used as local immunotherapy within the bladder. About 20% of patients are diagnosed with cancer that invades into the muscle of the bladder. So the muscle is the thickest layer of the bladder, kind of like the fleshy part of the mm -hmm. avocado. And these patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer are typically treated with either a few months of chemotherapy followed by a surgery where we take mm -hmm. the bladder out or mm -hmm. by using a combination of chemotherapy with radiation treatments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be the invasive one. That yes. would be the invasive. Now about 10% of patients actually invade beyond the outermost lining of the bladder and mm -hmm. either through the bloodstream or through the lymphatics, the cancer can spread to other parts of the body including the lungs, including the liver, and sometimes the bones. Mm -hmm. So um, these patients are said to have metastatic or advanced disease, and the mainstay for treatment for them is systemic therapies, either intravenous chemotherapy or intravenous immunotherapy, or as we will talk about later, sometimes oral pills. Okay, well, that's a wide range of things that go on there. So Jen, uh, you had mentioned if you have um, blood in your urine and something comes up and you have to have further tests done, mm -hmm. what kind of tests are done to, to detect if you suspect that there is bladder cancer? Sure, good question. So you're right, we talked, that, uh, talked about the fact that blood in the urine is usually the first sign of cancer. Um, so we often receive as urologist referrals from primary care physicians who either have patients who've seen the blood in the urine or microscopically have detected it on a test. There are a number of evaluations that we do just routinely for every patient who comes in with blood in the urine. And again, um, most patients with blood in the urine thankfully don't have cancer. There's other causes, but we're, our goal is to capture those patients who do have cancer so we can have a very timely diagnosis and then treatment. Um, I think first what I'd like to do if it's, uh, I think we should define our roles in the cancer team because I think that becomes a little unclear. Our patients get confused. We have a lot of cancer providers involved. I'm a urologist, so my role is the procedural based portion mm -hmm. of uh, urologic cancers such as bladder cancer. Uh, Krithi is a medical oncologist, so she uh, treats patients with the systemic therapies that we have available. And then the third member of our team is a radiation oncologist. Um, and each of us have different parts to play in this whole multidisciplinary care of the patient, which is so important, and we have great communication amongst uh, the team, and each of us own those little pieces of the evaluation. So the patient often comes to me as the urologist first, uh, because the primary care physician refers them. And the, uh, one of the initial tests for evaluation of blood in the urine is a CT scan. And we're looking at the kidneys, we're looking at the ureter, and we're looking a little bit at the bladder. A CAT scan's not great for looking at the bladder, um, but it gives us a good idea if there's anything going on in the kidneys that could be causing blood in the urine, or if there could be, as I mentioned earlier, a cancer related to the bladder and the kidneys. So we start with a CAT scan. We sometimes do some urine testing in the office to rule out urinary tract infections. And then a procedure that we as urologists perform in the office is a cystoscopy. And simply that means a sm very small flexible camera goes into the urethra, which is what we urinate out of in men and women. We use a little bit of numbing jelly. We look around inside of the bladder. The procedure takes about two minutes. It's instant uh, results and gratification. Mm -hmm. So right then and there we can see it's kind of like a colonoscopy. So we know exactly what we're looking at. And it can tell us, is there a tumor? Is there no tumor? What are the characteristics? Um, and we can give the patient an idea right then and there what we're uh, looking at inside of the bladder. Um, so that's one of our biggest modalities in urology um, evaluation of hematuria, blood in the urine, is the cystoscopy, the look inside of the bladder. There's some other additional testing that we use initially and then in follow-up for patients with bladder cancer. Probably the most common one that we use is called the cytology. Patient urinates in a cup. The um, specimen is given to a pathologist 
who looks under a microscope and looks for cancer cells. So in patients who have um, typically more aggressive cancers, there may be cancer cells that are detected and it can tell us, yes, there's cancer at an initial diagnosis, mm -hmm. or in follow-up, it can help us determine those patients whose cancer have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, up to 50% to of patients who've had bladder cancer will have a recurrence. Wow. Um, it's very common. It's mm -hmm. kind of like skin cancers that often will pop up elsewhere. So even if we successfully treat one bladder tumor, there may be another one that shows up later. So we're constantly performing the cystoscopy mm -hmm. and cytology to make sure that there's no recurrence of the cancer. Oh, wow. Um, one of the other things that we had uh, wanted to talk about briefly is, um, and this is also to you, Jen, um, the, the thing of healthcare disparities, mm -hmm. meaning some people are treated differently, and in particular women. So, mm -hmm. what are your what are the points here for women with bladder cancer? Sure. So we know um, from epidemiology the studies of the, how likely it is for people to get bladder cancer and the traits that people who have bladder cancer often have, that men are usually affected more often than women. As physicians, we're aware of that. So our bias, our tendency is to assume that a woman, especially a postmenopausal woman, a woman who has gone through menopause, if they have blood in the urine, it's related in some way to a female issue rather than a mm -hmm. bladder cancer. So a lot of times it's it's um, explained as a urinary tract infection, which are very common in, in mm -hmm. women in, after they've gone through menopause. So there's a tendency not to diagnose the cancer as early as we do some other patients, male patients, um, who are less likely to have a urinary tract infection. Um, so what we always have to be cognizant, aware of that fact. And when a patient persistently has blood in the urine and there's no urinary tract infection, be very aware that we need to diagnose those patients early and rather than just prescribing antibiotics, be alert mm -hmm. to the fact that there could be some underlying problem rather than just an infection. Right, and mm -hmm. I think that's an important point that uh, women out there, if they hear this, mm -hmm. should, should push the push the envelope a little bit if they yeah, need to. Yeah, and they so. sh themselves should not r write it off in their minds as another urine infection. They should let their primary care doctor know. Right, right. The other thing we were talking about before we started this um, is something called gel mito. Mm -hmm. What the heck is that? <laughs> so we talked, to, uh, Krithi talked a little while ago about the bladder washes that are very effective for early bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. um, some of the ones we use are chemotherapy agents like mitomycin, gemcitabine, or BCG. Um, that's a different mm -hmm. type of bladder wash. Um, for cancer that occurs in the kidneys and the ureters that's related to bladder cancer, it's the same type of cancer but just occurs elsewhere in the urinary tract, we don't have a lot of great options for patients besides a very large surgery. So um, this medication, mitomycin gel, was recently approved last year by the FDA, um, and it is injected into the kidneys under a little bit of sedation in the operating room. And it, if it helps to treat any cancers that may be in the kidney and ureter, the same type of cancer that occurs in the bladder. We're pretty excited about it. It really is changing the landscape of how we can treat some of those less aggressive cancers. Oh, wow. um, so we are um, rolling that out here at UMass, um, for looking forward to taking care of patients and being able to offer this as a new yes. treatment option. Oh, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. So let's say I get concerned about this. What's the first step that I should take? Concerned what do I about have? if I let's say I have blood in my urine, mm -hmm. what's my first step? Call your primary care physician right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. uh, report any other symptoms. So your primary care doctor is going to want to know: Are you having urinary frequency burning? What started this? Is there any other factors that go along with it? So the first call should be to the primary care doctor, and often what they will do is order urine testing. Mm -hmm. Going to look for a urinary tract infection, as that's the most common cause. And um, then if they feel it's appropriate, they'll refer you to a urologist, mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. We'll take Off the evaluation from there, exactly, <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn to, you were talking about a lot of treatment options and a lot of new things that are going on and everything. So what is offered at UMass? What's offered through your clinics? Either one of you, either Jen or both, jump right in. I'll let Krithi talk about our multidisciplinary approach to our patients. I think that's one of our greatest strengths um, in our program. Certainly. So um, we have a team-based approach. And in order to evaluate a patient, typically patients see all the different members of our team, whether it is a medical oncologist such as myself, a urologist such as Jen, or a radiation oncologist. We are also backed by a stellar team of pathologists. 
radiologists and interventional radiologists as well mm -hmm. who specialize in genitourinary cancers. We all meet periodically in our urology tumor board meetings where we analyze each new case. We come up with a comprehensive plan, keeping in mind the patient's individual goals and preferences so we can come up with a comprehensive yet customized plan for each patient. So that really helps our patients. It helps mm -hmm. us understand their needs and mm -hmm. give them the service they need and they deserve. We are also very fortunate that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, our cancer research office staff has continued to support our clinical trial efforts. So our accruals have not gone down significantly mm -hmm. despite the pandemic. One of the trials I'm most excited about for bladder cancer patients is a trial where patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer mm -hmm. who are typically treated with chemotherapy followed by surgery, on this trial, they have the option of trying a combination therapy. So combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Yeah. Our hypothesis is that by combining two different types of treatments, we may be able to maximize the cure rates and increase the number of cancer survivors. So we are very excited about this study being available at UMass. Um, you know, for about 30 years, there were no new drug approvals for patients with advanced bladder mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. up until 2016, when immunotherapy first got approved for patients who were previously given chemotherapy. This was a game changer um, and completely changed how we viewed the prognosis and um, overall survival of bladder cancer patients with advanced disease. Um, a few years later, in 2009, two more drugs got approved, a new type of chemo as well as an oral pill specifically meant for patients who target a specific mutation called FGFR. So not for everybody, but patients who have that type of mutation within the genomic makeup of their cancer cells. So it's a very gratifying and exciting time to be a bladder cancer doctor. Um, the most recent update we have is from our American Society of Clinical Oncology's annual meeting from 2020, where Dr. Grievous and his colleagues conducted a large phase three randomized trial called Javelin 100, in which basically they demonstrated that instead of treating patients with a certain number of cycles of chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and then waiting to give more treatment when the cancer starts growing again, we should in fact start putting them on maintenance immunotherapy right away as soon as they've completed their frontline chemo treatments. Using the strategy of chemo followed right away by immunotherapy maintenance mm -hmm. has now shown not just improvement in survival, but also has demonstrated that you can be more effective at keeping the cancer at bay. Mm -hmm. So it is indeed very exciting and we feel very yes. fortunate in being able to offer all these state-of-the-art treatments right here in central Massachusetts. And I think as you were mentioning with recurrence, you had mentioned it's a 50% recurrence, which is pretty impressive. So that's really a breakthrough. Yeah. And I think I'm, there's a couple of other points I wanted to ask you. So. I think the most important thing is to say that you are in contact, not just with your own team, but with teams all across, probably all across the world, but definitely across the United States. And you go to meetings and you know, people say, oh, you go to doctor's meetings all the time. Well, that, they're important. And that's one of the reasons why you need to hear what other people are doing and what's working and what isn't working. So that's very, um, very encouraging and very interesting. And I have one other question about that. Um, you had mentioned a radiologist and an interventional radiologist. What's the difference? So interventional radiologists are physicians who are radiologists mm -hmm. who read scans but have special training in being able to do procedures. Now these procedures could help us in maybe establishing a diagnosis when patients mm -hmm. have a new diagnosis mm -hmm. of cancer by doing biopsies. But more and more we are also uh. starting to see um, evolution of these interventional radiology techniques in managing pain, for example. So nerve blocks, for instance, for patients who have excruciating pain that's not controlled with medications. So interventional radiology is now becoming a part of oncology, interventional oncology, mm -hmm. where we use procedures that are not as invasive as open surgeries, not just in making the diagnosis, but also potentially delivering treatments for symptom management. Right, right. 
It's, 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 it definitely takes a team, that's for sure. It does. Oh my goodness, that's very exciting. So looking at, you had mentioned what's new in advanced disease. Anything else that you, um, in, in whatever, as far as urology goes, we've heard oncology, as far as urology goes, anything else new in there that's very exciting, new to sure, hear about? Sure, absolutely. So one of our goals as urologists, as I mentioned, the superficial cancers can recur very frequently, is to mm -hmm. detect those recurrences earlier mm -hmm. and take care of them all at the same time rather than finding them over time as we surveil these patients, we check them with the cystoscopy. So there's different techniques that can be utilized. Um, in addition, we call it white light, is the standard camera that we typically use to look in the bladder. Um, there's a different modality called narrowband imaging that we utilize at UMass in the operating room to help detect cancers that may have otherwise been missed with the white light. Um, so that's that's been a real uh, nice advantage to have that technology available to us. And um, for quite some time now, we've been trying to be more progressive and, um, I guess, aggressive in the protocol surrounding major surgery like removing the bladder. It's a very big surgery, mm. up to eight-hour surgery. So it's a tough one for patients to recover from. And um, there's been a, a nationwide push for the ARIS uh, pathway, which means trying to get the bowels working sooner, get people up and walking sooner, get their, their recovery just much faster than it traditionally had been. And there's a, a lot of different components that go into that, um, but it really seems to help a lot to get these patients back on their feet and recovering to their baseline. That's really, that's great. We are almost out of time. And I have just a few seconds left. If you have anything quickly that you'd like to add or say before we end, anything else? I'd just like to add that patients should continue to advocate for themselves. Yes, indeed. It's yes. very important. Um, I'd also like to say that I think every hospital in the country right now has very good protocols in place for keeping patients safe. So please do not delay care. The healthcare environment is safe for you to come in and receive the care in case you've been thank postponing. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Yates, you. Dr. Middle. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. This is Dr. Linda Young for the Worcester District Medical Society and WCCA-TV. Thank you. Thank you.